There we are. Yes, I got it. We are recording. <laughs> Welcome, people. This is Oliver Schirach from, yeah, which show do we take? We take from depression to expression this time. And on the other side, I have Kellen Flokiger, and we connected last week, actually. And so today we have a interview conversation on my podcast, and tomorrow I'll join Kellen for his podcast, which is like crazy many episodes and crazy full of information. It's, uh, I don't know how many episodes I listened. They're so deep, um, honestly. Thank you for that work so far. You're welcome. Tomorrow, this week, I think we're putting up episodes 715 and 716. So that's where we are. <laughs> yeah. And you started in, uh, what was it? 2020, right? Yeah. We're, we're about two and a half years in. We started right after the pandemic. It's kind of funny how it started. I've been doing you know, motivational speaking and all kinds of stuff. And we'll probably talk more about how that stuff started in the show. But uh, when the pandemic first started in you know, March of 2020, the first words, you know, lockdown came out of somebody's mouth, right? And in, in the US <laughs> and Canada, we were looking at the world and the cases were in Italy were first really exploding. That was the first real hotspot, if uh, we can remember back then. And so, and, you know, and then it was spreading here and people were blocking flights and all this stuff happened. And, you know, maybe for five minutes, we thought, oh, no, this is Armageddon. It's going to destroy the world, right? Uh, back in those days. And somebody who was in a mastermind that I had been in a few years before knew that I did speaking. And they weren't a client, but we got to go know each other pretty good in this mastermind. Anyway, they called and talked to my wife, who's my business partner, and uh, said, they were looking for some motivational stuff. And they said, uh, does Kellen have a podcast? And because they were looking for something to do, lockdown and, you know, energy or whatever. And we didn't. But my wife said, yes. And then she came downstairs and said, we have a podcast. So I started Your Ultimate Life in April, roughly, of 2020. It, you know, it took some time to get organized and stuff. And so we've been going for, you know, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, eight, 20 months, no, 24, 30 months. And, uh, you know, episode 700 and whatever. And I don't think we're ever going to quit. We did go from daily to start with to about twice a week now it, and a little bit longer. The first ones were 15 minutes for the first couple of years. Now they're 30 minutes. But anyway, so yeah, that's the story of how it started. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. Uh, don't tell me it was the 13th of April because that would have been my birthday. <laughs> that just started. I, I'd have to go look. I don't know what day the first episode went up. Uh, yeah, I, I cannot check because I told you uh, last week I can only go back to f episode 506 or 7 or something like that. Spotify doesn't allow me to go further uh, uh, back into the reservoir. I don't know why, but that's uh, how it is. I don't so, know. I'm sure somewhere. But anyway, I'll see if I can find you some links to earlier. Yeah, that would be actually interesting to see. Um, also, then when you know it, then you can upload it uh, or link it from your web page. So if people want to listen to the early shows. Um, awesome. So it's on, on my podcast when I have to people the first time, because some people have two or three times on the show. I start to have like icebreaker questions, but you're like so open and <laughs> most people I have on the show are very open and uh, don't need to really have an icebreaker. But anyway, so if you have to describe yourself or, you know, in a talk uh, with like three adjectives, three words, what kind of words would that be and why would you choose those to describe So yourself? I have three words that are my life purpose, love, create, serve. Uh, and everything I do is about that. My personal declaration is about that. Uh, I love you, and I'm speaking not only to you, but each person that's listening to this. I don't need your permission. Uh, I define love in a particular way so that it's clear. To love someone is to choose to use your resources, and I think of them as spiritual, physical, emotional, mental. So I choose to use my resources to serve you in your highest and best interest. And if I do that, then I can say I love you. So love any person all the time, no matter what, even if they did something bad to me or 
angry or whatever. I just don't live in that space. So love is the first one. It's the most powerful force. It's the creative force of all things. So that's the first word. Uh, and love desires to express itself. So I love doing that. I, I make things and everything else. The second word is create. I'm a creative at heart, and that has a whole story about my depression and why that got, you know, what happened and the creative stifling for many, many years and all that stuff. Anyway, so create. In that context, I have uh, 18 books. I've written, I'm writing two more. I have a lot of music. Um, I write songs that go with some of the books. I also do other kinds of music. I paint and different stuff. So that's the creative part. And uh, I also love helping people create with their gifts. So that goes to my mission. The third word is serve, because my experience, having been 30 years in corporate and made a lot of money and then being miserable and now 15 years ago changed directions completely, my discovery is that we as humans are happiest when we're in love and service of each other. So I do every breath, every day, literally every day from morning to night. I, I, I'm after a goal this year to help 50 million people to discover and to serve with their gifts. And that's the short way. I, the long way is discover, develop, and serve with your divine gifts and talents. But it doesn't really matter. It's lean into those things that are in your heart and soul to do and quit worrying about what people think and quit worrying about whether or not you can make money and quit worrying about all that stuff because you will. The answer is yes, you can be happy. Yes, you can make a living. Yes, people need your gifts. So love, create, serve. Those are my three words. Yeah, yeah. And they definitely are listening to... I don't know, 20 or 30 episodes of your podcast so far. <laughs> that message comes pretty much through and I love it. So, and <laughs> what kind of color would you be if you would be the new color in a coloring box? It can be any color. What kind also of fantasy. color? Yeah. And why would you be that color? You know, one of the sentences in my PTAC, my personal truth and commitment document, says, I am love and pour over your heart like warm sunshine. So what is the color of warm sunshine? What is the cover color of being acknowledged and cherished? I'm that color. Wow. That's a multitude of colors. I know. It just changes. It changes yeah. when you think of it, right? Yeah. Yeah, awesome. Love it. Yeah, but that it, it fits to how you describe yourself. So now I didn't really introduce you. We just went straight in <laughs> with the podcast. But um, out of my head, what I remember is like you said, 18 books, right? Yes. 18 books. Um, you have been, um, oh, how do you call that? Very high in business for many years. Yes. And you have a motivational speaker. And as you said, you create a lot of things. But that all kind of the life you have now, this love, create, surf person that that started in like 2007 ish. Right. Or was that? That was exactly right. Before? before 2007, if you met me 15 years ago or 15 years in a few months, because that the, the the pivotal event was in August of 2007. If you met me before that, you would have found a self-absorbed, arrogant, high-powered person who was also a drug addict, who thought a lot of themselves and made a lot of money and really truly hated themselves and was anything except what you see now. So it would be a completely different person, uh, inauthentic, but so good at what they did that I could be arrogant and get away with it and miserable. So that would that's who I was and who I am now. <laughs> <laughs> that's what yeah. I actually when I was listening before the episode, I thought like I'm gonna give some more in the podcast episodes from you just to get some inspiring. And I was thinking like authenticity and exactly this, you know, you were this power uh driven person which made a lot of money. Like you said, like really a lot, and you met some really important people and yet some very important decisions to take so how would if you could go back to the people I, I i don't know how many people you've met from your past life and how did they see you 
and how did they tolerate you um, when you said you, you were so good that you could be arrogant? I, and that's weird to say, and it is arrogant. It sounds arrogant to say it. And I understand that. And you you or your listeners can create me any way you want to. But the truth is I was recruited and brought in to when people, you know, and there were billions of dollars on the table and a lot of mad people. I was the guy that got hired to solve those kinds of problems. And I, I happen to be really good in this particular narrow area. So I'm not saying world renowned in the area of competitive electricity markets. So some, you know, you buy electricity and you have, you know, we're running our computers with it and everything else. Some areas in the world have deregulated electricity where instead of having to buy from the local utility, you can buy for whoever you want. Well, doing that is a very complicated process, and it's caused a lot of problems. California did that. The province of Alberta did it. New York and Pennsylvania and Maryland, that area did. Uh, Texas did. There are some places in Europe that have. But deregulating electricity required the creation of market structures that's completely different than any other kind of commodity because electricity can't really be stored in any appreciable quantity, you have to make it the instant you use it. Well, that makes markets really clumsy at providing a commodity that has to be created the instant you use it. Like if you go in your kitchen and turn on the toaster or turn on your oven, some generator somewhere, literally within a fraction of a second, increases its output. You can't not do that because otherwise the system doesn't stay balanced at 60 cycles or 50 cycles, depending on where you are in the world. And that instantaneous nature makes it really hard to create an effective market structure. And the creation of electricity market structures was the area that I was literally a one name person. There were four or five of us in the world who were that level and people knew who you were. And you got called to go do those things and solve market power problems when market participants were misbehaving and, you know, create rules and that sort of thing. And so I, I was that, you know, in the United States and in Canada, I was a one name person. I testified before the U.S. Congress. I did all this stuff. So I, I don't mean that to say, yay, me. I developed that skill and I was that. And that's why I made a lot of money. The The sad part is I didn't understand how to take that position and do good, be a good person. I was, I was frightened. I was the imposter syndrome. I felt like, well, if people really knew who I was, and the truth is I had been married and divorced three times. I had ruined relationships. I'd been in and out of rehab. I'd struggled with depression and stuff all my life. So it was like on the outside was this facade and the facade was held up because I had absolutely awesome skill at this little area of life. But as a personal person, I was a wreck. I remember often going home and thinking, you know, when the lights go out, I don't know who the frick I am. I can be anybody you like. Put me on the stage, give me a three-piece Armani suit, and I can perform. But I don't know who I am. And it got to the point where, you know, I'd attempted suicide a couple of times. I was that miserable personally. So the fact that I created this money and then was so miserable just demonstrates something really that we all really know, which is money doesn't make you happy. Power doesn't yeah. make you happy. It is what it is. You have power, you make money, people pay you for whatever they pay you. But how many celebrities are miserable? How many people commit suicide? How many people are in and out of rehab? Robin Williams is an example a few years ago. And you can, you can, you know, the list goes on and on of celebrities, rock stars, fit movie actors, famous people of all kinds that got stuff going on. And then one day they're dead. Yeah. So, but how did people see you when you, when you say you were that arrogant, so good that you can just get away with whatever? They were scared person, of me. But... They were intimidated. Uh, I was, <clears throat> and I cultivated that thing on purpose because it helped me keep my position and everything. And I kept people away from my personal life. Uh, I kept them segregated 
And so my kids knew the mess. They knew that what was going on, but they also were, you know, living at the trough of the fact that I made this money. And so they were enjoying the fact that we had all these privileges, but they knew the mess that was going on. And my exes knew the mess. Like I had three ex-wives and some of them hated my guts and did all they could to make life miserable. And one of them didn't, two of them did. And so it, it was a disaster and I had to fight to keep it all separate. And sometimes I was successful and sometimes I was not very successful. And so they contaminated each other like you would. At one point I was on the governor, governor's staff in the state of California and the chief of staff dragged me in the, her office one day and s told me all this stuff that she'd heard. And she was worried that my scandals were going to take down his administration. You know, that kind of yeah. stuff. And so those contaminations happen and it wasn't pretty. Yeah. Yeah. So people were scared and you were basically keeping up the facade so people don't get too close to you because you didn't know who you were. You were just playing something. So when when we talk about, you know, from depression to expression, how would you you describe depression? What is a depression? Well, from your there's, point there's, yeah, there's clinical depression and it's in the DSM five or six or wherever we are, <laughs> the diagnostic manual, I think it's up to five, but that's old now. But anyway, um, you know, there's clinical depression, there's chemical imbalance, serotonin, you know, minus this, that, and the other. I I'm not going to even talk about any of that. What I mean is uh, for me, it manifested itself in a conviction to the very core of my DNA that I wasn't really good enough. That no matter what I did, me, when you strip away all the titles and the cash and the decorations and the vacations and the season tickets to this, that, and the other, when you get rid of all that crap, I as a person don't matter. I'm valueless. And even worse than that, I suck. And I'm the cause of pain. And I'm the cause of suffering and, you know, all of that sort of thing. And I believed that with all of my heart and my making a lot of money and buying a lot of things, vacations and stuff was a way to camouflage or cover or compensate from what I held as an internal truth that I wasn't, I, I personally really as a being didn't amount to much. Wow. Well, where, where does that come from? I mean, from the outside, you were really good in what you did, but how comes that you were feeling so terrible? Where does it come from? Well, I, I can't say for everybody. For me, it started when I was young. I, w I was raised in a two-parent household that looked like it would have been okay from the outside. My mom was particularly fanatic about religion, and so there were a set of real strict things that, it wasn't just be a good boy, Johnny. It was, you have to do these things or you go to hell. So I had discipline from as early as I can remember all the way up until I left home at 17, that today would be felony child abuse. So physical beatings and discipline that were immoral, illegal, wrong, and crushed the life and spirit out of my heart. I was the, the largest memory I have of my growing up years is fear. I was always afraid, sometimes afraid of the physical part and sometimes afraid of, I, I didn't, I, I had to hide. I had to pretend I had, I, I learned to lie. I became an extraordinary liar, pathological. And it served me well as a broken person because I never got caught in the lies. Well, you said this because somehow I could remember all that crap. But it made me like I was pretend. My whole life, from my earliest memory, I was I was phony. I had to do things to make people like me. So everything I did was to make me matter in somebody's eyes. Whoever's here, what can I do right here, right now, so that you think I'm cool? Uh, you know, I do I know something? Can I help you in some way? It wasn't just bragging about me. It was sometimes I would. You know, I used to love reading the encyclopedia. So I read a lot and I was a bookworm and isolated. And part of the 
religion was I didn't really have any friends and I was very isolated. And so I, I remember, for example, I was in a Boy Scout troop and I snuck out and ran over to the local store and stole candy bars so that I could give them to the other scouts because I thought maybe that would make them like me. You know, so I became a thief oh. so I could buy somebody's affection and attention. And there were all kinds yeah. of things like that. It was always a game. What do I need to do so that somebody will tell me I'm okay? Okay. And that was because you were, as you said, you were in fear of the physical or mental, whatever, abuse, mm -hmm. uh, because you were not really a problem of being able to be yourself then. I couldn't. And that goes right to the, that, that went on. And so I left home at 17 and you would think, or you could think, well, as soon as you get out of that environment, you'd be okay. I don't really know why I tie it to the religion or the religious aspect. I somehow believe that because my mom must have God on her side, that my whole life's purpose was to get back in her graces, her good graces for her to tell me I'm okay. And that's how I lived for the next 35 years until 2007. So I, if I made more money, will she tell me I'm okay? If I do this, but the creative side of me, I wanted to be a musician. I loved music. I started playing the piano and my mom was a decent musician and she taught us to play the piano, but it was only intended to be, you know, use it in the community or use it in the church or something. The idea of being a musician was they're all drug addicts and lushes and unfaithful and bad people. So you can't be a musician. So when I wanted to do that and I was gifted, I played the piano really well and still do. And I played five or six instruments before I graduated from high school. I wanted to do that and that was not okay. And then I opened a recording studio in my early 20s because I loved it. And I did it not because I loved recording everybody else so much, but I did it so that I could have other people pay for the gear that I wanted to record my stuff. <laughs> and it worked and I did okay, right? And it was successful enough that I finally had to make a choice between giving up the regular career type job and doing the studio full time because I was making enough money to do that or uh, to take, to, to satisfy her and be okay in the family kind of thing. I, I, I gave in, I shut down the studio. I sold everything and pursued the corporate crap with a vengeance. Well, that literally felt like I'd paved over my whole life and built a false thing that happened in 1992 when I finally decided to, to, to give up who I was. And so for the next 15 years from 1992 to 2007, I pursued that and I was extremely successful at it and got all that stuff. But the truth of who I was, was dead. Yeah. Yeah, I was just also thinking, you said you wanted to be a musician, and in the eyes of your mom, the musicians were drug addicts. And then you said you were like heavily drug abuser. Oh, afterwards. I became her worst nightmare. I, I became her worst nightmare. I was an addict. I was married and divorced three times. I ruined relationships. I never knew how to have a relationship how to tell the truth, how to be a person. I attracted broken people. One of the women I was married to was raised by an alcoholic stepdad. And one of them, her mom committed suicide when she was nine and she was lied to about it till she was 21. And so they had, you know, I attracted all these broken people. And at the time, I didn't know what any of that stuff did to anybody. I, I didn't know how to help. I didn't know how to be a support. I, I was just doing the only thing I knew how to do was make money and hide who I really was and live in this miserable up and down roller coaster thing. And when I create these big success positions, then I would sabotage them because I'm not good enough. I don't deserve this. So I would do something to lose this situation. And then I would go create another one that made even more money. And then I would ruin that. And then I would create another one that made even more money. And I would ruin that. And I did yeah. it with relationships and I did it with work. Yeah, it's 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 crazy, but th these things you hear. I mean, uh, in other podcasts and with psychologues, and especially when you don't feel you're good enough, how entrepreneurs are sabotaging in the last moment the deal, which would set them in in a position so they could pursue something else, because deep 
deep deep down is like this i'm not good enough and i'm i'm, I'm i was just thinking like i want to be a musician and they're drug addicts so i probably sh you know like i get <laughs> i get parts of that as well um perhaps subconscious and, and it, we become what we think right what we say tell ourselves a hundred percent so uh, and, and and so you can be successful on the outside, materialistically speaking, with even not following your true self. So we talked last week, but not on the podcast, the, the divine intervention, as you call it, in August 2007, so which, which catapulted you out of that life. So what was that? Well, so let's set the stage. Uh, by August 2007, I was I had ruined several careers, but I was at the top of another one. Uh, I was making so much money that my three thousand dollar a week cocaine habit didn't matter. I had four of my ten children living with me. I was single again for the third time, and I I had attempted suicide two weeks before. So that's me in August of 2007. And I came home from work on a Friday and I didn't have a job. I had a bunch of really lucrative contracts because of the, because of who I was and what I was doing. And <clears throat> on a, I came home on a Friday night and I was getting ready to go out and party for the weekend. And that meant I would go somewhere and, you know, get high and do whatever and come back on Monday or something. And the kids were all old enough. They were teens and late teens. And so, this, you know, I wasn't a good dad, but they took care of themselves as best they could do at that age. But anyway, I was going to go party for the weekend. And before I went out to party, for some reason, I had the desire to uh, the urge, the yearning to turn on the television. Now, that doesn't sound like anything, except I don't watch TV. I still don't watch very much at all. And I picked up the remote control to do it, looked at it and realized, I don't know how to turn this on. So uh, I'd had the electronic store come in and put in, you know, the biggest TV you could buy and all the cool stuff, but I didn't use it. So I didn't know how to turn it on. So I had to ask one of the kids and my 16 year old daughter, she took the remote, punched the buttons and, you know, threw the remote at me, dip weed, and, you know, left the room and it landed on a program I'd never heard of, which didn't mean anything because I'd never heard of any of them. It was a program titled Intervention. Now, if you don't know what that is, that's a reality TV show. And uh, it's about families who are worried about a loved one who's got a serious problem, and they stage an intervention. So they'll get a professional, a counselor, or a shrink, or a priest, or maybe all of them, and some family members in a place at the same time and invite the family member there. Usually, they have to kind of trick them to get there, but they do, and you know, it's an intervention. And so they get there and there's all these people trying to help. I mean, it's done out of love. So that's what happened. That's what the show's about. And the protagonist on this particular episode was a high ranking executive with a cocaine problem. So I watched about 10 minutes and I said, yes, yeah, screw that. I'm not watching this crap. And I turned it off and I went and did some other stuff for a few minutes and was getting ready to go party. And I just had this an irresistible urge to turn the TV back on. So I did, <clears throat> this time I knew how. So I turned it on and that program started over. And no, I don't have a DVR and no, it wasn't on the schedule and no, it can't do that. I understand that, but it did. And so it scared me and I thought, holy crap, <clears throat> I guess I'm supposed to watch this. So I watched it and it did not go well. The guy that was in trouble yelled at his family and swore he didn't have a problem. and stomped out of the intervention and said, yeah, screw you guys. And it got over and that was it. But it freaked me out enough that I, I didn't go out to party. I went to bed. And so when, when I went to bed, I went to hell. <clears throat> and what I mean by that is uh, I went somewhere. Uh, it felt out of body. It felt, I was in a dark room. It felt like a theater. And the, I could hear voices and see stuff. And the scenes that played out in front of me were scenes from my life and they were all focused on suffering and the suffering was it started with the suffering that had been inflicted on me as a little kid all the beatings and terrible things up through and including all the suffering i had inflicted on everybody else 
as a rotten husband and a addict and you know liar and all the things that I had been and it, the intensity of the cumulative suffering is indescribable it was it was overwhelming and after a long time sort of witness to this disaster a voice simply said it is enough and I wasn't angry or frustrated it just said it is enough and so I woke up and the sun it was weird because the sun was shining in the window of my bedroom which was it shouldn't be because the window faced west and I got up and realized that it was five o'clock Saturday afternoon so I'd been somewhere for nearly 18 hours and I thought about what had happened and I realized okay I've been invited to change I I don't I have no idea what to do during the 35 years from when I left home at 17 to then I'm 52 I had never talked to anyone about my internal struggles I had never been in counseling for depression I had never done any of that stuff and I had no idea where to start but what I knew was I was done I I have to do I'm doing something different and so I threw away a thousand dollars worth of drugs I had laying around because I always had that and I quit cold turkey Uh, three thousand bucks a week to zero in that day so that got me sober but it didn't do anything about how I got there in the first place which was the self-loathing the not good enough that whole roller coaster thing of believing I wasn't okay but I was sober (laughs) so the that was the the divine was just getting started the second half uh happened a couple weeks later so that was uh that weekend and so Monday I went back to work but I knew I had to get away from all that I was doing I knew I had to completely change my life, but I really didn't know how to do what to do next. In the position that I had, I used to get all kinds of free stuff because I made really important decisions that affected billions of dollars. People used to give me stuff, not bribes, but expensive bottles of booze, like I needed more of that and free tickets to this, that, and the other uh, to be nice. And so one of the tickets I got was a a pair of tickets to see a Yo-Yo Ma concert. Now, if you know classical music, you know who that is. And if you don't, that's fine. But in classical circles, Yo-Yo Ma is like, ah, he's a cellist (laughs) and he's the most spectacular in the universe. He's just unbelievable. So I thought, wow, this is fabulous. Um, But I'd I'd be ashamed to waste this other ticket because, you know, I was single and I wasn't interested in a relationship or doing any of that. So I thought, well, who can I give this to? So I asked in the groups that I managed, who likes classical music? And some lady in one of the groups said, well, I do. And I said, well, okay, have I ever given you anything before? Because I gave away stuff, you know, all the time. And uh, she said, uh, no. I said, okay, fine, see you there. So I gave her the ticket and uh, we met at the venue And the concert was spectacular and the seats were great. And uh, halfway through the concert, you got to remember now, at the date of the concert, I'm two weeks, stone cold sober. And I had this feeling come over me halfway through that felt, that reminded me of what had happened two weeks earlier. And this voice said to me, you need to marry this woman. And I reacted sort of, violently I said are you insane (laughs) I've screwed that up three times officially and some other just horrific messes in between that this not happening so uh later that night we're backstage because they were not only great tickets but they were backstage passes and tickets to the reception and all this stuff the voice came back and said comma and you need to tell her tonight (laughs) And I freaked out. I thought, well, you know, first of all, I don't actually know if she has a a relationship or boyfriend or something, because this was not like I wasn't inviting her out. I just had an extra ticket. So I didn't know if she had a relationship. And besides that, she worked in one of my groups. So she could have me arrested 
for harassment, you know, workplace harassment, that kind of stuff. And I'm like, no, but you don't win those arguments. So I did. And it went about like you would have expected. Are you insane? Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like what? But the good news is she didn't have a relationship, which I didn't know. And she did not call the police, which was also uh, fortunate. And she, you know, she left, went home. And because we hadn't come together. But anyways, in, in the next two weeks, she had her own set of experiences. <clears throat> And two weeks later, she walked away from her career. I resigned from millions of dollars of contracts, and we walked off into the sunset, essentially, together, not even hardly knowing each other. And next month, in December, we'll celebrate our 15th wedding anniversary. <laughs> and the reason that's, I mean, it's an amazing story by itself, but the important part in terms of divine intervention is she was literally in the most literal way I can say, the angel that was sent and agreed, volunteered to help me become a person. Like she taught me how to be a friend and how to have a friend and how to tell the truth and how, you know, uh, stuff I had never learned in, in my life and in all the other relationships. She was invincible in finding me people to talk to you know, counselors, and she would go do research and f find me stuff to, to literally help me on the road to becoming a person, to recover from the depression and from the self-loathing and all that stuff. And I've asked her a thousand times, what on earth possessed you to walk away from your career and off into the sunset with a drug addict? because everybody knew they didn't know but they knew and she said i just knew to the core of my soul it was the right thing to do and so that was still an invitation because it was terrifying for both of us and the other one two weeks earlier was just cold turkey but they're all invitations so as spectacular as those stories are Everything that ever comes into our lives is issued as an invitation to change because we still had to do all the work of getting to know each other and me going to see all these people and just changing my whole life to, to become a person that could do anything besides be afraid and hate himself and, you know, the things that I had done my all the first years of my life first decades of my life. And you know, the most fun thing about the whole thing, her name is Joy. <laughs> like you can't make this stuff up. Yeah, Joy brought joy to your life. So, yeah. so I mean, that's the whole story. But when I want to go deeper for for I know several people which are depressed for a long, long time, right? Antidepressants and whatever, counseling here, counseling there, 20 years, 15 years, 25 years, not getting out. And they say, wow, awesome. Yeah, you, you had this intervention, you, you changed all these things, but how did you get out of the depression? For Was me, it just like a... No, no, not at all. For me, my, the, the not good enough and the believing I was a phony and all the rest was clear in my DNA. So it was, it was a gradual process and here's, and I'm not saying this is the magic thing. I wrote about it in the book, Tightrope of Depression, my journey from darkness, despair, and death to light, love, and life. And I listed a whole bunch of things in there that I did and do. Uh, I changed gradually. So in addition to, you know, counseling and I tried different antidepressants and all that kind of stuff, that's all fine. But those are outside in remedies. Depression, it, there may be some chemical imbalance and you may need, you know, some chemistries and antidepressants to help you do this, that, and the other. That's fine. I, I'm not saying anything about that. Go ahead, use those things. But the most important thing was I, I, I took control of my life. Up until then, I said, I didn't realize it, what I was saying is, 
I am a product of all that has been done to me. I am the outcome of all those inputs. And what I declared, and it didn't happen instantly, it was a work in progress and will be forever, I suppose. I am who I say I am. I am the architect. All those inputs happened, and I'm not pretending they didn't. But I refuse to allow them to be determinative of my future. That's like saying, because somebody hit me and broke my leg, I will have a broken leg forever. Uh, because, and maybe I will have a limp, but I refuse to allow the fact that they broke my leg and I have a limp wreck my life. I refuse to allow the fact that I've had these divorces. And today I still have, I told you I have 10 kids and some of them because of all the divorces and addictions and everything, I still don't talk to me. So there's plenty of opportunity there for the first five years. Some of them denied that I'd even gotten sober. They wouldn't believe that. They said, no, you're lying. You're faking it, right? Because they were in a place that they were, they were joyfully blaming all of the problems in their life on their rotten dad. And so they could not allow for, for the fact that I was sober because then that wrecked the place that they were putting the blame. Well, I can't, I can't blame me anymore, right? So there's all kinds of opportunity there. But the key right here is I own the levers of my life. I don't know all the things I have to do to stop living in depression. Maybe some of it's medication. Maybe some of it's counseling. Maybe it's meditation. Maybe it's a choice to just take little tiny steps. But what I declare without hesitation or anything else is I own my life. I refuse categorically to be a product of what happens outside of me. So even if I can't take enough chemistry to fix the serotonin imbalance or whatever else, chem even if I can't get the neurotransmitters perfect, I recognize this is a neurotransmitter imbalance. I don't have to act as a person that responds just to these feelings. That's like saying every time I get mad, because I feel mad, I'm going to beat the crap out of the person in front of me because I can't help it. I feel mad. Okay, but we don't do that. We say, well, I feel mad. I'm going to deal with this in other ways. I'm going to go exercise. I'm going to choose not to be mad. I'm just going to do something else. I'm going to reinterpret things. Feeling lack of energy and lack of worth is just a feeling. It is a collection of neurotransmitters in our body, just like every feeling is. Every single thing that we feel is a collection of those, that cocktail. So I'm going to do everything I can to fix the cocktail. Exercise, light, yeah. meditation, all the rest of it, and chemistry if I need it. But I'm not going to allow that chemistry decide who I am. I'm just not. I refuse to do that because I know what it is. Yeah, but the thing is also many, many mindfulness teachers, yogis, whatever, uh, they say uh, these, these feelings or emotions, they're fleeting. Some say they're only lasting for like 90 seconds. If an emotion is lasting longer than 90 seconds, it means that you kind of get trapped in it and you kind of hold on to it and um hundred percent the way i describe it is feelings have a shelf life okay they have a shelf life the neurotransmitter cocktail that causes us to have feelings all the way from a knot in our stomach to tension in the shoulders to anger or frustration or sadness they, they have a shelf life they just do because the body is continually processing and refreshing all those things so that's why people say count to 10 if you're mad. It is a tool to allow you to process some of that chemistry. Think of drinking, those of your people who drink. Your body processes alcohol at a certain speed, but it processes it. Okay, it yeah. goes away. Well, 
the, your neurotransmitters are exactly the same. And the idea that you are powerless and helpless against that is nonsense. It's just not true. But but how comes that so many people have that feeling like I cannot? Is it is it learned? Is it by our culture? Because no one really teaches us. What what, what can we do as grown ups? I don't know. My my audience is somewhere between twenty five and forty, the most part. Mm -hmm. So I guess some of them are parents by themselves, right? Because we learn a lot of things from our parents. On don't learn <laughs> so what would you say like if you if you could go back ah what what would you change for your kids to help them so so <clears throat> there's two ways to answer that question one t one way people always ask me well now that you know all this crap what would you have different in your life and the answer is nothing i love the past i love <laughs> where i've been and i love where i'm at okay good nevertheless <laughs> if i could go back and talk to my younger self and to your audience, I would say there is a disease and it isn't COVID and it isn't anything else. It's called the Wittot fungus and it's spelled W-I-T-O-T -T, and it kills more people than COVID ever will. And you know what it stands for? Because Wittot is an acronym. It's what I think others think. <laughs> Okay, oh. and you, you the, the most important thing you can do is to say, I don't, I refuse to be poisoned by that disease. I refuse to allow my state of worth, worthiness, capability, talent, expression to be determined by what I think others think. The judgment, someone's going to judge you. They're going to pass a judgment on you because you're green, blue, pink, gay, tall, short, fat, skinny. I don't care. That disease that we have to be governed by what we believe someone is thinking. The truth is most people aren't even thinking about you. So that is about a millionth of a percent of what you think it is, first of all. But second of all, it doesn't even matter. There's a teacher, Byron Katie, who I love her work. She, one of the things she says, and I think she's quoting someone else, says, what someone else thinks of me is none of my business. <laughs> because all it reflects, what someone thinks of you, anybody, it, it reflects where they are on their journey with their set of experiences and their judgments and biases, with their lenses on, they're looking at you and they have a thought about you. Okay, that is their thought about you. That's okay. You're free to have that thought about me. Go ahead. And you and you and you. Go ahead. You can all have your thought. The problem comes when I decide that I'm going to, one, guess at what those thoughts are, or even if I'm not guessing and they tell me, I'm going to allow what you think of me to decide what I do and what I think of myself. So I lived needing to be important, needing to have somebody tell me I was okay in different ways, either with money or with a relationship or with whatever. I, I needed that. <clears throat> so one of the most important tools, besides whatever you do with your health and meditation and medication if you take it and all the rest of that, is to learn to love yourself for who you are. The thing that is missing in every person I talk to is self-love. And, and this is a big piece, right? Um, to be authentic, to self-love, self-acceptance. Mm -hmm. um, forgiveness starts with self-forgiveness. Um, and this mm -hmm. is the biggest part. So any method or tool you use that helped you to actually chip a little bit more... Uh, this warm heart, like the ice away from the heart, so to, to allow more self love and self acceptance. Yeah. In fact, the last book I published is titled Forgiveness A Journey of Courage to a Place of Freedom and Power. 
And one of the most important things for me was forgiving myself. I had done a lot. I mean, my parents had done whatever they did. Okay. That's them. And, but I had then been in my own depression and failure. I'd been a lousy dad. I'd been a drug addict. I'd been this, I'd been that. And so all of those things weighed on me. And I bought into the story that I was somehow responsible for everything, every piece of misery that was around me. And those that wanted me to feel that way were just jumping on. And so I bought into that. <clears throat> so yes, I have some specific tools. Create a self-love ritual. The first piece is get up in the morning every day and look yourself in the mirror. Slow down. Look yourself deeply in the eyes and say, I love you. Now, this might be really awkward and clumsy at first. I had a client who I started working with him on this, and he came back the next week and said, I would rather put my hand in a meat grinder because it was so difficult for him to do because he wanted to look away. He wanted to change the words because he was thinking of all of his failings and all of the things that had created this image of not okay, not enough, not worthy, not, not, not. And I said, that's okay. Just keep doing it. Keep making a choice to love yourself. Love yourself for even being standing here trying to do this exercise. Love yourself for not being giving up completely. Love yourself because you have an idea of going forward. I know without question, if I talk to somebody like that, I can, in 10 minutes, I can think of, we can find in conversation 25 things that you've done right for which you should love yourself. It's your call if you choose to focus on all the things that are bad or if you choose to allow yourself to be human have made mistakes and love yourself for trying. Yeah. So where's the gratitude coming in, in your world into that forgiving part and self-love? Uh, some people I love, the gratitude is, is enormous. So <clears throat> loving yourself is number one. Another thing is practice. People call it an attitude of gratitude. Some people call it a rampage of appreciation where you list 20 <laughs> or 50 or 100 things you're grateful for or gratitude journal, those are all fine. The way I do it is I, I, I don't find it very effective to list a whole bunch of things I'm grateful for. Instead, what I do is pick one, and here's why. <clears throat> when you have felt real gratitude, like something happens or doesn't happen, and you have this physiological and spiritual reaction of real gratitude, so grateful. You know what that feels like. Okay. So let's, the, the point is to create that feeling. So focus on one thing or maybe two that you're really grateful for and think about it and look at it and experience that thing until you feel real gratitude, because in that way, you're actually changing your neurochemistry. You're causing your body, your mind, your glands to secrete the neurochemistry of gratitude. So you're not just saying a bunch of stuff, you're experiencing yeah. gratitude. And, and, the same thing with love. Keep going. Yeah, that's, um, I, I was, yeah, asked, I don't know, the 10th time probably to, to listen or read uh, Napoleon Hill's book. I don't know. You probably have read it as well. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm finally, <laughs> finally going on Spotify. You find several audio versions from different uh, ways. This one was from the 2000 somehow addings. And I also know Joe Dispenza and all these things. So I can see, I mean, he, he, He's one of the early ones which describes this feeling, see your future, see where you're going, feel it as you are, as it already happened, as you are that person doing uh, these things. And, and that's also with the gratitude, right? And the forgiveness really. <sighs> and, and I had a very, I mean, about the forgiveness, that just pops up now. Um, I don't know if I've talked about it in other episodes. Uh, when I go in Denmark, we have dog forests, which I love because then you can go in there. The dogs can play with each other, can park, whatever. No leash. Perfect. Awesome. And it's even in the forest where I live. 
and there's this one man and he um, was very drug addicted and has also left Denmark, was in France. So he actually speaks French to me sometimes, which I found was funny. And he has a lot of dry skin. I don't remember what it's called, lupus or whatever it's called, but you have like this dry skin. And it's definitely, I found out after talking to him, it's because he was abused as a child, three, four, five years of age, uh, from a man, a friend, a neighbor, from his father, whatever. And I tried to explain to him the forgiveness part because he's the one suffering he he was suffering with numbing down through drugs with numbing down by running away and his body is clearly exposing disease and that I, I tried to explain to him forgiveness is not to forgive the act what the person did because it's definitely not a nice act uh, in this case several kids he knows have been abused by this man sexually physically um but it's to forgive oneself for holding on to, to that energy to some some way. And it is difficult to explain, um, but I can I can see it the more I hear about these things, right? It's like, it's like okay, my, my mom, my dad, my neighbor, my teacher, my boss, my whoever, the guy which cut off in front of me and I had an accident afterwards, you know, let go of this energy. Um, it's beautiful. So any anything you could add, because I, you have so much you, you share in the books. Uh, yeah, forgiveness. Let's talk about forgiveness. Forgiveness has nothing to do with pretending. Let's talk about forgiving others, and then we'll talk about forgiving yourself. We'll talk about your friend. For, if You can forgive the guy that abused you. And here's what I mean. I don't mean pretend it didn't happen. I don't mean make it okay. I don't mean that what he did didn't matter. I don't mean any of that. Here's the core of it. It is not our calling to administer justice. We are not called to go somehow beat that person or put them in jail or cause them to suffer in some way. First of all, we don't have authority to do that. Second of all, it doesn't even work because we see movies all the time or read books or maybe, you know, real life examples where someone is hurt. They go after someone to get revenge and then they finally get it. And there's the person beat up or dead or whatever. And then they look at the camera and say, I thought when this happened, I would feel better. And I don't. You know why? Because them suffering, I don't care how much, doesn't fix yours. It's the wrong medicine. Justice isn't mine to give, to meet out. That belongs to the law. It belongs to God. It belongs somewhere besides in my hands. So the idea that uh, that person's on their own journey and karma or the universe or whatever is gonna handle that. I can't handle it, it's not mine to handle. All right, if I let go of the need to somehow exact justice for whatever they did to me, I don't care how bad it was, then I'm left with this truth. I suffered because of that thing. That is a truth. I am still suffering because of that thing. That is a truth. You will continue to suffer because of that thing until you let it go. And letting it go doesn't have anything to do with them getting punished or caught or whatever it is. It has to do with you simply choosing to no longer allow events of the past to have power in the present. Because if I keep letting the abuse that was heaped on me, or your friend keeps letting the abuse that was heaped on him continue to have power in the present, that other person isn't even suffering. You are. And that just means that you are diminishing your light and your ability to do good. You are reducing your ability. I'm reducing my ability to serve and bless others. I'm limiting my own presence because I won't let that go. So when I finally realized that, I'm just diving to forgive my parents, my mom, everybody. I don't know whether or not they feel bad, and I don't even care. I need the gift. 
I need to empty my heart of that anger, that bitterness, that need for whatever. I need to get that out of here because I want to be free. So forgiveness of even people that hurt you is a gift you give yourself. And it is in your hands and has nothing to do with whether or not they got caught, punished, or anything else. That is completely something else. Yeah, that, that's one thing what, what I just remembered when you talk. It's um, what I heard as well to help people to forgive bad stuff that happened to them is to see that, you know, hurt people hurt people. Mm-hmm. To actually see that these people must have been in a lot of pain to be able to do certain things as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and actually, you know, when you come from your heart, you like feel not feeling pity, but, you know, you you feel that um, I think it's easier when I see like, wow, this person has been in a lot of stress, for example. And that's why I have a car accident. Not that I had, but could be, right? Uh, and then you're like, wow, I'm feeling so sorry for them. Right. I hope everything is fine instead of being like all red and like this guy should go to prison and <laughs> should fear, like, uh, should um, should be punished and should be in pain. So I, I love what you said. It's 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 really good. So let's turn a bit around to now we've been really in the <laughs> in the dark places, <laughs> in the heavy places. Let's turn it around because what you're doing is bring light and bring joy and and, and help people to 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 bring gifts to to let their 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 gifts shine and um find their gifts because when we talked last week you you came and said like hey there's like three things you can bring to life uh, but we probably talk on your podcast more about those but what are gifts according to your definition so what are the gifts of people here's the here's the prerequisites to living the reason it's good to talk about forgiveness first is because you can't serve with your gifts if you're carrying sludge and dirt so forgiving everybody that hurt you just love them just make a choice and let the need to punish go somebody else will do that or somewhere karma or whatever the same thing applies to yourself as long as and that this is big for me as long as i was carrying self-loathing and negativity i couldn't let my light shine either so i forgave myself why i'm not pretending i didn't do bad things i'm not pretending i didn't have all those problems i did But that was then and this is now. And if I keep letting that stuff from back then be in my backpack now, all I'm doing is carrying a thousand pounds of rocks that just prevent me from doing good. So forgiving yourself and forgiving everybody else completely, absolutely letting it go is liberating for you. And then when you have no bat rocks in your backpack or you're working on throwing them out as fast as they come in, then you are able to discover and serve with your gifts. So for example, a gift someone has that I know is a a gift of brightness and hope and they teach classes. And every time she comes to teach a class, she does it for a lot of corporations. She doesn't just come and teach the material, but she infuses the whole process with such fun and hope and happiness that people love her classes yeah the material's great but they like how they feel around her so that's a gift that she has somebody might have the gift of speaking i do i have a fabulous way with words and that's why i write and help people to write i have music that i use you listening right now i don't know what your gifts are but what i do know is you have them and they're the things that you feel called to do ways you feel called to help, things that feel easy and good for you and fun. And you may have downplayed those. You may have thought, well, yeah, I feel like that and I'm really good at it, but I can't make a living or I can't do anything. And so what? That can go away too, because all that is is wet blankets on your parade. It's just weight that you're carrying around. So I have another client whose motto is embrace your inner weirdo. (laughs) <laughs> and he's, you know, he says that for fun because he's he's trying to help people understand you right here right now have permission to be your own authentic loving self we are happiest and we are most powerful when we are in love and service so instead of arguing with that or thinking of all the reasons it won't work why don't you just go start being in love and service even one percent more if you said you know what i'm going to be loving and in service one percent more what does that look like i don't know i'm just going to smile more today 
uh, on purpose. If you just made 1% change, do you realize in 100 days, which is no time at all, you'd be 100% different? Like Mm -hmm. we have this idea that somehow I have to do everything all at once or I suck. Well, who made that rule? So find the things in your heart that you feel that you do well and do them instead of making up reasons why you shouldn't or they don't matter. And I just think of myself, of course, I cannot talk for other people, (laughs) really. There's a lot of things in my head I love to do. And somehow many days are just passing and weeks are passing. I'm like, now I wanted to do X and Y because I really love to do it. And I didn't. What what do you tell people which have situations like that? Uh, You're now a musician or a creator. Let's say they want to play guitar or piano at least two or three times a week. And somehow the week passes and they never have time, but they really look forward to doing it. What, what, what could be reasons for that? Well, so I'm going to do two things. We'll talk in general and then I'll be specific. If you have something <laughs> you want to do and you don't, then whatever you're doing is what you really want to do. Okay? You do what you want. People say, I don't have time for this or I can't afford that. And I ask, well, what's important to you? And then they list all these things they're not doing. And what I say is, well, show me your calendar and show me your bank account and I'll tell you what's important to you. (laughs) Because those are the only two things you have, your time and your resources. And today we use money for resources. So wherever you're putting that, that's what's important to you. So either love what you're doing because that's where you're putting all your time and your energy or change. So one of the ways I help people do that specifically is how people keep track of their time. Uh, I has, lift, go, the, go, go through the last two weeks and try to find where you put all 168 hours. How many hours sleeping? How many hours taking a shower? How many hours exercising? How many hours working? And list all the things you do. When people do that, they always come up 20 or 30 hours short from 168 hours of a week. And they can't really find where it went. There's nothing wrong with that, but it just illustrates the fact that we use a lot of time without thinking about it. So then I have them track their time for a couple weeks, down to maybe 15-minute increments. Again, no harm, no foul, but you just if you track where you spend your time, then you look and you say, okay, this is what I'm doing with my hours and minutes of my 168 hours in a week. Am I happy with that? Because most people don't sit around and stare at the ceiling. <clears throat> Their lives are full. So if you're going to do a new thing, piano, guitar, write a book, create a course, do something, then you're going to have to make a trade. And if you keep track of where your time goes today, you can make a trade on purpose. I'm going to not do this so that I can do that. Because you're not going to invent 10 more hours in a week or five to do a new thing. You're not. You're going to have to trade five hours from how you're spending it today. And if you track your time and you fill up your 168 hours and there's nothing that you're willing to trade, then you're already doing what you want. And you can't tell me that this other thing's most important because it's not. Because otherwise you'd trade this, this time. You'd find a way to trade it. And so we work with very specifics. Let's find out where your time's going and then I'll I'll help. I'll ask some questions. Why are you doing that? What is the benefit to you? You know, if you do this other thing you say you want to do, learn and, you know, do some music, be in a rock band, write a book, fix your relationship, read read more books. I, I don't care. Where would you, what would you trade for that? What's less important? And I've never met someone when we go through that exercise that doesn't find a bunch of time that they could trade. They always, yeah, they there's always a lot of that. there's a lot of empty time, at least in my day, mm-hmm. where I'm like, "What did you do the last two hours?" Not really moving from one room to the other, basically. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, there's days like that, right? And sometimes, some days you need to just have nothing to do. <laughs> we we and don't you have can to be schedule efficient. that. You, I do. I schedule time on my calendar that says white space. And nobody can schedule anything there. And the, my deal with myself is when that time comes up in my calendar, I can do whatever I want. 
And yeah. sometimes I'll keep doing what I'm doing. But the fact is, I scheduled myself empty time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's also what I heard, like for innovation and uh, creativity, having like, um, you know, 30 minutes is not good enough. I mean, I've been told from a friend like, oh, you have 30 minutes to, back then I did a lot of photo editing. So just get up half an hour early in the morning and do 30 minutes on the photo editing. I'm like, if I want to be creative, 30 minutes are like too much pressure. Uh, so if you want to be really creative, you have like this white space of two, three, four hours or even more. I mean, some people put like a Saturday from 10 o'clock to four o'clock. It's just whatever. If I only um, have an hour uh, creative, I had the time to let the creativity come mm-hmm. or the space. Um, now, you say you do whatever you love and writing down these things. I'm also thinking finding your gifts. I mean, when, when I go back to your story, and and you were this super successful corporate guy, but you wanted to be a musician. And where we look where you are now, you're helping people from with love, creation, and service. Uh, has that part been something you always wanted to be as a kid as well? When you look I, at I what wouldn't have now. used those words. I wouldn't have used those words as a kid because I didn't know them. Like our, the way we understand our purpose and our gifts changes over life. I don't think at 10 years old, suddenly you're going to have an inspiration and pronounce the rest of your life. <laughs> we, ha- we have experiences and it, it sharpens and refines our understanding. If we allow it, there's lots of people that go through life rejecting all those invitations they get, those nudges, those spiritual promptings. And so they end up living the same year over and over again, accepting those invitations and saying, hmm, I wonder what I could do there. Hmm, I wonder what that would look like. So, yeah, the, the way I said it then was I wanted to be a musician. Well, I do a lot more than that now. Yes, I have a recording studio. Yes, I record music. Yes, I do songs that tell the stories from the books. But what I realized is uh, it's not just music, it's the creative pull. And so my version of that is uh, to write and to do songs. And then the real joy is recognizing that as humans, we are built to love and serve each other. So I could just write and do music and put it out in the world and, and hope people love it. There would be nothing wrong with that. I made a choice that I found even greater satisfaction in helping other people succeed. So I could just write and do music and try to sell my art and, or I mean my writing and music. And I do, okay, I make a little money doing that. But I found way more satisfaction as it evolved in, in helping those around me make the discoveries that I finally made only sooner <laughs> yeah. than I did. Yeah. So uh, that has turned into right now my greatest joy helping each person to love themselves, to realize they're valuable, to go on a treasure hunt and serve with their gifts. I don't know in five years if I would, if I will describe it exactly the same way, but that's how I describe it and experience it now. Yeah, I was just thinking uh, um, or remembering many people say, what did you do as a kid? Uh, that's like a stepping stone to find out what you love. Now you said as well, you were in a very strict religious family and you were, uh, how you call it? You were not having such a big social internet interaction network. So probably you already long to actually help others, to be connected to. I to, desperately to wanted friends and all that kind of connection. I felt that lack from way back in elementary school, far far back as I can remember, I felt like an outcast and I couldn't connect with people and I didn't know how and et cetera, et cetera. And I've learned how to do all that, but I certainly didn't, didn't know how to do any of that. No. And I did long. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, But it could have been, if you would have had the chance, you would already have been like the, the talkative Mm -hmm. uh, storyteller, Mm -hmm. whatever it is, the helper. (laughs) Yeah. Um, But there's like uh, two words or two, short sentences which which i have a bit highlighted here in my notes it's you know your podcast is called the ultimate life and i hope i get it right so you say it's 
creating a palace of power and you have like this, this, this seven cornerstones on that and then the other part is the declaration of who you are so, so I'll, I'll explain that a little bit so the purpose of the podcast was how do you create your ultimate life and i define it really simply it's a life of purpose prosperity and joy purpose prosperity and joy and the way you create it is by serving with your divine gifts so ultimate life for me and this is one of the things i'm going to ask you how would you define the ultimate life when we have our show because i ask everybody that but i define the ultimate life as having a life of purpose prosperity and joy by serving with your divine gifts now what you referred to there is uh, how do you create power because if you're going to create a life of purpose prosperity and joy you need to have some power power to do stuff and so the palace of power was a, a whole 50 episodes on all the elements yeah. of creating personal power and seven pillars that hold up the palace of power. And I created this whole fantasy description. And it's an element of how we tap our internal yearnings and feelings. How do we create power? And then one of them was love and one of them was listening and one of them was presence, how we show up with people. And all of those kinds of things are part of that. So that's the reason I've got 700 episodes is because I take it apart in lots of little pieces. And so that's what the palace of power was about. But the the whole thing about creating your ultimate life is simply a declaration. And I make this declaration to you and everybody listening. You can have a life of purpose, prosperity, and joy, and you can have it today. It doesn't have to wait. The idea of I will be happy when, and then we have a big long list of when I make this much money, when I fix this, when this, when this, when this, is a never-ending rabbit hole that you'll never get to. So it is possible to simply decide you're going to have joy in the journey. And learning to do that is no different than learning to love yourself or learning to forgive someone. It is a process where you start with a declaration. This is who I am. I'm a person who loves every day just because I said so. I don't care what happened. So that gets to the declaration. They're the two most important things that I've done since 2007 to get myself healthy and happy and having that ultimate life of purpose, prosperity, and joy. Number one is a personal declaration. I call it a PTAC. P-T-A-C, a personal truth and commitment statement. It's several pages long, and it changes whenever I feel like it. And I have most of it memorized, and I recite it, and I play with it. And it's not for anyone else's consumption. I didn't write it to impress anyone. Sometimes I share parts of it with clients, depending on where they are and if they're trying to figure out who they are, because that declaration is really a powerful tool. But it is a choice. It is a declaration of who you are in the world. Why? Because you said so. Because that's what you have decided to be. That liberation. I don't have to be. I don't care what anybody else thinks. I don't care what anybody told me or is trying to make me do. I'm just done with all that. I am this in the world. And some of them are kind of esoteric, right? One of the things I declare is I am honesty and speak only truth. Well, I picked that one, I think, because I had such a habit of saying what people wanted to hear and, and just lying because I thought it was going to do me better. So I am honesty and speak only truth is a declaration about myself that I don't care if anybody likes or agrees with, and I don't need anyone's permission. It's who I've decided I am. And another one is, I am love, and pour over your heart like warm sunshine. Well, when, I, when you have a set of those kinds of declarations that come from your heart, they're not measured by anybody else, because I'm not asking for anyone's approval. Then I have a set of tools with which I can measure. Okay, if I say I'm love, how would love respond in this situation? What would love say here? What would love do in this, with this problem? 
And it gives me a really easy way to make choices and decisions that feel good. Because I'm the one that said I was love and pour over your heart like warm sunshine. So if I say, how would love who's pouring over somebody's heart with warm sunshine act here? Okay, well, if I don't want to do that, then I can't say I'm love and pour over your heart with warm sunshine. So I better fix that and say something that represents who I really am. Yeah, this, yeah, it reminds me a lot. Um, you, you mentioned it uh, over several podcast episodes, but it writes, um, it's Stevie, Stephen, um, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Stephen um, Covey. Chubby, yeah. And he also says, like, how do you want people to talk about you when, on your death um, ceremony, on your uh, the burial, right? How do your parents, how do your siblings, friends work? How would they talk about you? How do you want them to talk about and remember you? It's kind of the same. And on the other thing, turning back the wheel of today's talk, you had a declaration of who you are inside yourself as well when... You made a lot of money, but you were miserable. It was just not a, a conscious one, not an intentional one. It was a product of that's who I am because of the effects of the world, the victim mentality. A hundred percent. And I allowed the declarations of worthlessness and everything else to be my declaration of being. And I behaved accordingly. Absolutely. And so what I said about helping people with that are struggling, throw those away and make your own declarations. You don't need yeah. anybody's permission. You don't need anybody's agreement. Just decide yeah. who yeah. you are. Yeah. And uh, yeah, for me, I think like for the people, if they haven't heard that before, like just try to think of it. If I die today or whatever, in 50 years, 100 years, how will people remember me? And and that's giving you kind of like a little bit of a compass in what direction to go. They remember me of being the generous person. They remember me of being the creative, which always finds a solution to the problem, whatever. Right? Or the one which is fixing the, the plumbing all the time, if that's what you want. <laughs> that's exactly right. And so the second thing, besides creating that declaration, is to create a daily creation ritual because if i make all these cool declarations about who i am okay and they feel really good when i say them but i don't do anything with them then they're just another pile of crap that i did at some seminar that uh you know i read a cool book and it made me say blah 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 and then a month later i'm like what so the a daily creation process i liken it to this we go to sleep every night. We sleep for, I don't know, six, seven, eight hours, whatever. The creator didn't have to make us, so we slept a third of our lives away. But he did. So, okay, cool. We sleep for a third of it. And I liken it to I die every night. And I wake up every morning. And the first thing I do, I don't read the news. I don't pick up my phone. I don't, you know, except go to the bathroom maybe. But I recite and live into the truth of my declarations. I create myself every single day according to those things. And if one of them doesn't feel right, I change it. But, but I use a thing that is consistent and resonates with my heart every day. And I create myself every day. This is who I am. Why? Because I said so. Because I said so, because I said so, because at the end of the day, because I said so is the most powerful motivator, because somebody else wants it, because I'm supposed to, because this, that, and the other, that's all bullshit. Because I said so is the only thing that matters. So the, yeah. it's, creating it's a like document a, and then using it every day to create myself is the magic. But how many pages did you say? 50 pages is yours, but you have like a one pager uh, or... How do you do that? Is it uh, there's lots of different pieces. Uh, I have one piece called the scroll of truth and power, which describes <laughs> me, but also describes, yeah, it's written in medieval language and with a very scrolly text. And then so I you have, have like another... a feather. So you had a nice feather with ink and you were writing this really it's nice. It's like that, right? Yeah, it's <laughs> like that. But that's another piece of it. And it describes not only me, but it describes 
clients. It describes people I help. And and the oh. first part, that isn't the first part. The very first part is state of being. This is who I am. And it's all I am statements. I am these things. And the yeah, last affirmations, one is... Affirmations, basically. Yeah, they're declarations. It's not affirmations, but it's... it's, it's declarations. Your, it's I like to call them declarations. Yeah. And here's what I, my last one, you know what the last one on the back of the first page is, the second page? It says, I am that when I fall or fail in any declaration, I get up, fess up, clean it up, and recommit. And uh, that is permission to declare boldly without the dance of, well, I'm not perfect. Bullshit. Declare boldly. And allow yourself to be human, and if you screw up, fix it. Yeah, that's... Yep, sorry. Hi, puppy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, with the declaration, right? We are love. And that's yeah. what I always want to be. I mean, um, I can see, I have some intentional, unintentional declarations, like which I found it was funny what, through webinars and quests. I always saw myself as a healthy, strong person, uh -huh. and, and and that's what has manifested throughout my life. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't have you know people look at me like bodybuilders. I'm like, no, I just I'm healthy. I like to use my body because I want to have this vehicle to be able to enjoy life. Mm -hmm. You know, so so that is one thing I have had for a very long time. It was never I've never read it, anything, but that's a belief I had, or I am healthy and strong. And I believed I'm honest, but I can see we talked, I think, last week a little bit about that as well, or another podcast with someone else, that I have the feeling I wanted to be authentic with everyone, myself with everyone, no matter where I am, I'm myself. Instead of acting differently in different situations, I do understand you have to sometimes be a little bit different, but you still, or communicate different, but still be yourself. Uh, yet I have the feeling I'm not authentic with myself and therefore I'm still wearing masks when I'm interacting with other people because I'm not authentic with myself enough or honest, vulnerable. And I think this declaration is definitely something to, you know, take off your clothes and stand in, naked in front of the mirror and write down what you truly want without looking away somehow. Love it. Can be painful. Can I, the uh, only reason it would be painful is if you say I'm declaring this and then you become aware that you're not that. I'm, I, I'm declaring this, but I'm not that. Okay, that's not painful. That is a, a choice. I'm still going to be that and I'm declaring that I'm that. And today I'm going to be, I'm in progress. I'm going to be 1% more of that. I'm going to be 1% more of that. And if you do that kind of declaration, what happens is you remember all during the day, in every conversation, in every choice, wait a minute, I said I'm going to be 1% more of that. I said it, I said it, I'm going to do it. I said it, I did it. 1% more, wait a minute. And that kind of practice moves you in the direction until you can declare whatever you want with full integrity. Yeah, that, it's beautiful. It's, it's awesome. I like that. Um, to have this um, acceptance that I might fail, but this is part of me because I'm growing and I'm moving towards that direction. Um, it's also like if you want to stop, uh, you went cold turkey with the drugs, but I mean, sugar is one of the biggest drugs we in society have. Like, and like I'm stopping with sugar, and then like, oh, I saw a muffin and I ate it. I'm I failed, and the whole week you didn't eat any sugar like no you didn't look we're just humans <laughs> um you're doing great right so it's, it's the same there um i don't know anything else right off the batch did i forget to ask you anything that's that you think should be added or i mean we have the near-death experience if i come but that's like a big chunk as well and I remember you told me last week, you see the near death experience in 2018, right? Uh, was kind of like the, the present from the higher being because you have changed and you took the divine interventions and invitations to change and become 
more the light being if we go spiritual here and woo hoo hoo. Uh, so you go to near death okay. experience. That's okay. I'm think... spiritual and woo woo. Uh, the in the industry <laughs> I was in wasn't, but the answer is I had a divine intervention. I busted my ass for 11 years, including failings between 2007 and 18 to do everything that I could. And in 2018, I died. And no, it, we, would, we really wouldn't have time to go over that whole thing because it's a long story. But, but we, we, can, we can link to other interviews. You can give me like whatever interview you think is covering it the best way, right? Then, so there's the a guy know named Jeff, Jeff Mara, M-A-R-A. He did a, a, a podcast that was only on that. And he has a quite an active YouTube channel, Jeff Mara, M-A-R-A. And he does, that's all he does is near-death experiences. But he told me afterwards that mine was one of the most downloaded and exciting <laughs> ones that he'd ever had. So there's one that I know thoroughly. I've discussed it on several podcasts and I'd be happy to do it, but it'd just be another long story now. So um, what you're right, I viewed that yeah, I died and it was terrible and I, I couldn't walk and I lost a lot of weight and I was in a coma for 17 days and on and on and on. So someone could say, oh, how horrible. And my answer is, how beautiful. Yeah, but you also saw the other side that we should I also did. look at that. Um, you you had a conversation with God, conversation with God uh, on the door. Mm -hmm. or what was the title? That's another um, book. <laughs> it is a book. It's called Meeting God at the Door conversations, choices, and commitments of a near-death experience. And near-death meant, for me, people mean that in a lot of different ways, my heart stopped. I died. I had three conversations with God at the door between life and eternity. I made a choice to come back. And there's a whole series of things in, in the context of that. But I did, and I did view it as a blessing. Yeah, and uh, and after that, again, two weeks after that, it seems like, or whatever, two months five after months. that. Or, five months later, five I months. had another, yeah. The, the, you had another choice to take. Uh, I with did the have another choice. I did. <laughs> so, but that's also in the other podcast, I think, because I've heard you it, talk It's in about some that. of the podcasts, and I'd be happy another time to do that, but it would just make this episode extraordinarily long. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm I'm thinking of chopping it in small pieces uh, because there's so much nuggets in, 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 in it already. Yes, about the whole thing that you became a public speaker and, and stuff like that. You mentioned in the beginning of the podcast, we might go into it, the 11 years until your near-death experience. Mm -hmm. um, is there any big steps that you took which are important or... Um, to who I you spent became the now. first four or five years, the first four or five years, Joy and I had to get to know each other and we were trying to decide what to do. And I felt the yearning to help. And so I knew that I had the executive skill that I had was really, and you know, the consultant work that I'd done, I was really good at helping people do hard things. I mean, that's what I was called to do. The big dog that could come into a really tough situation and help get shit done. And so I thought, well, I know how to do that. And I've been doing that. What is that? And I thought, and I want to help. I, I really want to help. I feel called to offer people the same kind of help that I've been given. So I thought, oh, that must be coaching. So in that first four or five years, I spent a lot of time getting healthy. I spent time exploring what it meant to, uh, to coach. I decided, okay, I think that's coaching. So I went to, you know, took some coaching stuff and uh, expanded on the, on the uh, uh, consulting work I'd done. And so the first four or five years, I guess, were getting started. I wrote the first books of my 18 in 2009. So a couple of years after that first divine intervention. By 2012, which is like, uh, or 2011, by four years after that, I uh, started producing. I wrote, a, I wrote five books on meditation, uh, a series to help people with that because that was a big tool for helping me with my depression. And I started uh, really being a coach in about 2011, uh, about four years. It took me to get organized, figure out what I wanted to do, write those first books and to start coaching. And then I began speaking and began looking for places to do that. There were no magic. Like I had to go find places to speak and find clients the hard way. And I really sucked at it to start with because I was coming out of this depression and I was scared. 
I didn't know how to get clients because when I was an executive, I was an executive talking about that thing over there. As a coach, it's a lot more personal, right? And so enrolling clients, I was horrible at it. I screwed it up all the time. I felt yucky. I felt yucky asking for money. I felt like it was asking for money. I felt like I was trying to convince people to hire me and all that stuff that's the complete wrong way to do this. And so I had to, I went through all of those things that I think every coach does, uh, you know, going through the, the pain of learning how to help people and make it not about you and how to enroll clients in a completely authentic, easy way. And so now, now because of those experiences, one of the courses I have is how to crush your client enrollment. Like there's no salesmanship to it at all. It's really easy. But I learned that by stumbling through the mud for those years and screwing up lots of things and feeling awful about it and everything else. And so I had to clean up not only my internal work, but I had to clean up how it showed up in enrollment conversations and building a coaching practice and, you know, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things I love to do is help coaches who are going through that trouble. I'm not good enough. How do I convince people? How do I find clients? Da, 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 da. And I remember that conversation so well. And today it's <laughs> fun and it's easy, but... <clears throat> there's a process and a path there's no magic bullet you know so yeah there's just all kinds of stuff so in the last since 11 to now 22 the last 11 years of the 15 i've been building a coaching practice and now i have clients all over the world and it's fun and it's easy and i get to speak a lot of places but nobody came and rescued me nobody brought a magic bullet to the door i had to do it <laughs> all one day one opportunity one conversation one event at a time yeah, and I started the, uh, the discussion last week with asking about um, one of your friends or someone said, he's better than Tony Robbins, <laughs> or I got more out of it. Mm -hmm. um, and then you came up, that was like, you did home coachings or home tech talks? No, I had events. Like I that. used to hold events uh, at the house, like uh, between five and 10 or 12 people. I would have them come for three days. So I would hold a three-day event. And they stayed in motels. I mean, it was just like, or hotels. It was just like a regular event. And I spent all day, every day teaching uh, mostly enrollment skills and self-improvement and that kind of stuff. And so uh, at the end of those, I would always interview people and ask them what they thought, what they got out of it for two reasons. One, it was a nice way to get people to say if they enjoyed it. But the thing that was more important for me is they got to think about and speak out loud what they learned because then they were able to take it home and say, this is what I learned. And then the follow-up question is, okay, good. What are you going to do with it? What is your next step? What, what are you going to take right now and do with that learning? Yeah. And so in that context, he said that uh, yeah. he had it, a lot it's, of experience with okay. Tony Robbins. Yeah. He'd been to a lot of Ro Tony Robbins events and he just felt like he got more out of it. Yeah, but it was also smaller. If you say five to ten people, <laughs> having Tony Robbins out, thousands of people going. He so. does. So, of course, you can go directly onto the persons. Super. I think I think I went a bit around um, in the circle. From I mean, I could feel actually the the heaviness uh, in the beginning of the talk, and I feel a bit sorry. And I hope you don't have to re tell your story too many times because it is heavy to retell the story even though you're in a much different place and i can also look in your eyes and look in your face and i see you're much lighter now that we went a bit more in the <laughs> lighter topics uh but again you have 700 plus episodes so there's so much more we could talk about all on the spiritual personal growth forgiveness uh finding your power finding your your gifts and, and your passion um but i think we will definitely link everything to your podcast because people can find anything and then we need to find out how we actually get to all the episodes if <laughs> you know i'm gonna check that up and i'll send you i've got your email i've got an email started i'll find out where to uh, a link to that i just i need to go find it so i don't know yeah it, it's I, I have no idea i know that um from other podcasts they have their listeners which created the database so people can listen to the old episodes because there's something like 200 episodes they allow on spotify i don't know how all the other Podbean, chromecast whatever they're called 
Apple Podcasts, how they are handling it. Um, if there's also 200 episodes only. I'll, I'll um, find your link. It's not hard. We've got a website with all of them, so it's not a problem. Okay, you have a website. So then I can also link it on the show notes and on the YouTube show notes so people can go there and listen to it all. So you have audio only and you have videos as well, but um, I don't know how long you have been doing YouTube. The video started with number 601, and we're not anywhere near doing them up. I think we only have the first 10 up, 600 through 601 or 610 or something, because it's a lot slower process, and we're just sort of getting organized about that. But I've been shooting them all as videos since number 601. I, I know the issue. <laughs> I know the issue. <laughs> um, on From the Depression to Expression, I have most of the episodes on YouTube as well. But it is extra work when you do it alone and... Um, yeah, but uh, some people prefer to see and look into people's eyes. <laughs> I love it. Super. Um, yeah, let me know if there's anything you want to share more because you gave a lot of advices here, like um, the declaration of who you are. That's definitely something. Sit down, write honestly what you want. No one has to look at it. It could be like a, a, a how you call it a vision board of yourself where you describe mm -hmm. yourself. Um, mm -hmm. But do it as honest as possible, I, I would suggest. <laughs> it's got to be truth. If it doesn't light you up, then it isn't, it's not done. Yeah, it's, yeah exactly. Super. But then with that, I thank you so much for that talk. It was awesome. And um, I still sometimes I feel like I'm in a movie when I interview people especially when I've listened to other podcasts and episodes from them, whatever they do, or read books. Uh, it feels like it's not live, but then I realize, shit, I'm actually interacting with these people. <laughs> so, so, so you're like, I'm dreaming. And um, yeah, tomorrow we are talking the other way around. That's right. That's going to be interesting. It's like the first time for me. So um, it'll be fine. I'm sure it'll be fine. Yeah, yeah. I have 140 episodes done, so it's time to turn the table <laughs> excellent well i'm looking forward to it super and where do we send people is it just kellen flukiger uh or um Ultimate so with Life? A name like kellen flukiger you can't hide uh <laughs> i'm i'm on there's two in the world and the other one's my son so my i have my website which is my name kellen uh i'm on facebook i'm on youtube i'm on linkedin uh all you have to do is spell my name right like, I can't hide. Okay, I'm on Amazon. All the books are on Amazon. The podcasts are also on Amazon, uh, as well as Spotify and all the other platforms. So you can connect with me any way you want. Reach out and connect. And if you want to have a conversation, let's have a conversation. Awesome. Yeah. And uh, with that, thank you so much. Thank you. Namaste. I'll see you tomorrow. Arigato. Namaste. <laughs>